The filling up with the Word takes a lifetime. It is not a one-shot deal. It is not instantaneous. It is not magic. God is omnipotent, but He chooses not to use His omnipotence in a magical way. What He does is He chooses to subordinate Himself to justice rules, and only if those rules are met does He get what he wants. That's his own sovereign choice. He chooses to submit. He chooses to subordinate. Love subordinates. Love submits. God loves justice. God loves righteousness. God loves the truth. That's in Psalm 89, 14 and 15. And, ooh, it's in another verse. I forget where. I want to say it's in 34, 5 or 33, 5. Um... I think 34.5 is Pamuna. All his works are in faithfulness. But it's somewhere around there. God loves righteousness and justice so he submits to it. Of his own sovereign free will. Instead of using his omnipotence to just being anything he wants when he wants it. That's the hardest thing to understand about God. Because we wouldn't do that. If we had the power to get something we wanted, we'd go get it. And we'd think that was right. God doesn't think that way. Okay, so you won't think that way either as you fill up with the Word. It takes a lifetime. Now, notice that there are these little arrows in the middle of the chart that are pointing in two directions, up above and down below. That's to indicate that everything is working on everything else. In other words, the five verbs are working on the stages of spiritual maturation, but the stages of spiritual maturation in turn feed back to the five verbs and give them extra oomph each time. So then also, the stages of spiritual maturation work on the third row of boxes, your benchmarks, and create uh, maturing uh, behavioral patterns of consuming Bible, spiritual skills, thought pattern, etc. But at the same time, those behavioral patterns feed back and reinforce and increase spiritual maturation, which in turn increases the verbs, which in turn increase again. So this is an exponential growth, and it needs to be exponential because God is infinite. Um, therefore, when you finish the spiritual maturation course, all these bottom row blocks the non-colored boxes are all filled up. That means that your soul has gone from what you started as being a little dot, you know, very small soul, childish, to king-sized, like your Lord is. And you need to be like your Lord in order to be a king, in order to have people rule, and you need that so that you have a way to thank Him maximally. Everything, as you mature, all you're ever going to want to do with what you are is thank Him, bless Him, bless everybody else too. There's no lording it over concept in spiritual maturation. Anybody's trying to lord it over somebody else, they're, they're childish. The more mature you are, the more you want to serve, not be served. And so you need to be a king in order to have enough to serve. That's the way, that, that's the way it works. So at this point, when you hit that olive box and you actually complete the course to uh, Timothy seven, uh, 4, 7 through 8, then you're, you got enough to serve and there, therefore your soul is king-sized. You will be thus crowned at the bema. Everybody will know who you are then. You don't want anybody to know who you are, but sorry, you have to be public in order to serve. So it goes with the territory. Um, <clears throat> there is... A great word, Greek drama. Dramas means race course, maturation race course, and it's a 2 Timothy 4, 7. And it comes from Treco, which is in Hebrews 12, uh, 1 through 2. And the reason that should be mentioned is that this whole thing is a marathon race to maturity. So those are the two verses that really give you a great analogy to the fact that it's long-term, the fact that it's a race, the fact that... Um, you know, there's a time limit. 
So therefore, in sum, the five infinitives are operating on you. That's Hebrews 4.12. Um, as you use the ten problem-solving devices, which again, your pastor will have his own way of classifying them, but he'll be saying the same things. Um, the results are going to slot into slot into the latter two rows of boxes, and um, at the charts for each stage as you're going to see in subsequent videos help you diagnose the pro progress. And as said before, these ten problem-solving devices are actually spiritual skills; they're thinking skills that you engage in, whether you have problems or not. I mean, you're thinking Bible just because you want to know. It doesn't mean that you have to have a problem in order to think Bible. So you're thinking and thinking and thinking spiritually. And as you age, you're going to do it more and more and more. Okay, again, you're moving from left to right spiritually as you age. So you can gauge where you are that way. Um, now... The, the last two points that I need to make are really kind of hard to understand without seeing the whole picture. But I have to state them now as part of this introduction to close it. Spiritual magnet, maturation magnetizes around the highest problem-solving device you've developed so far. And all the lower ones run through it. It took me 35 years to understand this. I've got to stress it. It's real important. You are always using... Even the baby problem-solving devices. I mean, that's spirituality. But as you age spiritually, you're moving from left to right on the page. For example, let's say that you're in the beginning stage of spiritual adulthood, where personal sense of destiny is. The primary function that's happening at that stage in your spiritual life is he must increase, I must dis decrease. So you're constantly reordering or rethinking and reconfiguring your sense of him versus you in your mind. That is, that is the director. And like Numi, the pointing out is what the Holy Spirit is doing the most at that phase. There's a whole lot of that in Plasso going on. But all the rest of the problem-solving devices, the thinking patterns, are also coming in, as it were, through the clearing house of personal sense of destiny. Because the objective um, of, this, of that part of your life is to readjust in light of God who now is the number one in your life. How do I readjust my whole life now? God is number one in me. It's very, well for me it was pretty traumatic. Maybe it's not for everybody. But um, when that happened to me it was like, oh my gosh, I've been thinking wrong all this time. I've got to start over. All right. And so you're thinking all of your earlier baby things over again. Your grace orientation notches up. Your doctrinal orientation notches up to, the, to serve the him being number one and you being under him as your life, as your whole life. That means everything else doesn't matter anymore. So that means all of your prior thinking goes through a retooling. And the same thing happens had had been happening as you reached each other stage. I mean, when you're a spiritual child and you first realize, oh, I need to use 1 John 1, 9, that changes your life. Everything gets retooled in light of that. And then, of course, being filled with the Spirit is a complete new, new focus. And then you start using and living on Bible doctrine. Well, you're basically divorcing everything that you thought of as a human being before and replacing it with whatever you're learning now. Well, that's a retooling also. So as you can see, as you're moving from left to right on the chart, you are still using the old skills, but they're serving a new purpose. They're crafting a new focus on the same old information. That's maturation for you.